When the galaxy is in its darkest hour, when the forces of evil threaten everything we know and love, when the very fabric of space and time is ripped open, creating insurmountable chaos, when we need a couple of heroes to save our arsenals, who will we turn to? I could use a bit of exercise. When Ratchet and Clank returned in February of 2007, it was on Sony's two-year-old PlayStation Portable. Size Matters was not its first mobile outing, technically following 2005's Going Mobile. But it was the first on-the-go entry to deliver the series' patented gameplay largely untouched. It was also the first Ratchet game to be developed by another studio. Having much more in common with Up Your Arsenal than Deadlock, High Impact Games modeled it as a classic Insomniac-style platformer. Clank! What a coincidence! What are you doing here? I am trailing Ratchet and Clank to see what they are doing, so I can join in on their next adventure. Hey, that's what I'm doing! No, wait, I, I mean, I, I, I... It kicked off with Ratchet and Clank relaxing in paradise when they're approached by a young girl doing a book report on the two explorers. She turned out to be a robot controlled by the Technomites, tiny inventors bitter that no one recognized them for their achievements. The story and the weapons were both amusing in size matter. Good luck with me, whatever that was you were doing. With a bee mine and acid bomb gloves standing out. The PSP made its name on delivering home console experiences you could take anywhere. And Ratchet's pick up and play nature made it a perfect fit for the system. If there is trouble, then it is our duty to ensure that. <sighs> It fit the PSP so well, the series came back to it a year later, perhaps to get back at Ratchet for hogging his own game on the PS2, and no doubt inspired by Daxter's successful solo project two years earlier, the famous duo was split a second time for 2008's Secret Agent Clank, starring Clank's dashing alter ego. The Eye of Infinity, a powerful and expensive gem, was stolen, and it appeared that Ratchet was the thief. With Ratchet in prison suffering through arena-style mini-modes, Clank donned his tie rang and cufflink bombs in order to find the real culprit and clear his pal's name. Gameplay was focused on stealth and espionage rather than brute force gunning, relying more on gadgetry to infiltrate the levels undetected. Quark was also playable, recanting his own experiences for a biography writer. That's what you want me to write? That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Where to next? Our next destination? Excitement! Both Ratchet and Clank Adventures and the PSP assimilated to the PS2 as well a year after their initial release. I believe my hand here has already been played. Oh yeah, and there'll be some furry guy with his little robot pal. If only we had some footage to show you. Uh, Captain Quark, we have the trailer right here. At the Game Developers Conference in 2006, fans got a massive tease of what Metropolis could look like in HD. Lots of franchises pride themselves on fancy technology, but it's practically built into Ratchet & Clank's DNA, so expectations of a new trilogy on the PS3 were out of this world. Some were concerned that the studio was split between two franchises for the first time in its history, and therefore, quality could be sacrificed. You'll get to see me, Captain Quark, in mind-blowing, jaw-dropping, high-definition detail. The Lombax robot team's first mission in HD was aptly named Tools of Destruction, another stellar example of Insomniac's explosive imagination. Does your life lack a sense of purpose? Do you constantly worry about finding steady income? Do you like killing stuff? Then join the Imperial Army and aid me in my humble quest for galactic domination. The PS3 game marked the beginning of a new chapter labeled Ratchet & Clank Future. The duo's extended vacation ended when they got a message from their old pal Quark that the city of Metropolis was under attack. Uh, got a bit of a situation here at the Planetary Defense Center. Nothing I can't handle, mind you, just a few thousand. Heavily armed robotic commandos, but I figured, hey, if you were in the neighborhood, maybe. Emperor Percival Tachyon of the Kragmites launched a massive Lombax hunt for you know who, so that Tachyon could erase the last of Lombax kind and complete his revenge. You are now entering Fastoon. Touching down in five, four, oops, three, two, one. Up until now, fans knew very little about where Ratchet came from or any details about his fictionalized race. What the... Where is everyone? I tried to tell you, Ratchet. The database said this planet was deserted ages ago. With the help of Talwin Apogee, the inseparable astronauts discovered the Lombax secret, the Dimensionator, a helmet capable of opening wormholes to various dimensions. The Dimensionator, built by eight of the brightest minds in Lombax history. The Dimensionator's ergonomic design is the culmination of nearly three Arcturian cycles of research. 
Tachyon used the helmet to bring back the Kragmites, but Ratchet and Clank kicked him and his dreams of galactic domination down a black hole. The typical happy ending was cut short, however, when Clank was carried away by the mysterious Zoni. It was the first direct cliffhanger in the series, and an unmistakable opening to another trilogy. Whoa, uh, Clank, are these the Zoni? Tools of Destruction expanded the traditional formula of traveling to multiple planets with branching paths, collecting weapons and gadgets along the way. Added to the mix was a new on-rails space combat minigame that involved flying and shooting waves of space pirates. Ahoy there, young scallywag! This be common slack! Scourge of the galaxy! Surrender your vessel, or be cast to the depths of the universe! The older games were known to make the PS2 buckle when the bolts were flying, but the PS3 had the power to handle the new cache of equipment with ease. Surrender your death bot and simply allow us to kill you. No one else need be harmed. Fair enough. Big new weapons included the six-axis control tornado launcher, the lock-on predator launcher, and the alpha disruptor, which reduced most bosses to dust. For the first time, Insomniac added a limited number of devices to Ratchet's arsenal, basically removing their ability to be upgraded or replenished from crates. These included the trash-talking Mr. Zircon, Mr. Zircon make death for stinky aliens, and the iconic Groovatron, which gave any enemy or character in the game dance fever. Clank got a few upgrades from his supposed Zony friends, such as robo-wings that allowed Ratchet to soar through the sky. The hollow pirate disguise was necessary to fit in with the best of the dancing pirates, while the Gelinator added a little spring to Ratchet's step. I love the ruins! Feng Shui meets drab and dismal, I dig it. Science, you half-wit! Tools of Destruction received a great deal of praise. Some reviews called it the best the PS3 had to deliver, surpassing other blockbusters like Oblivion, Warhawk, and Insomniac's own sci-fi shooter, Resistance. To date, it sold 1.7 million copies. Spike TV awarded it the best game on the PlayStation 3 that year. Along with staying on par with what fans had expected of Ratchet & Clank, this new entry also brought character animation to a point that rivaled the movies. Fans braced themselves for another long wait, but Insomniac had something already in the pipeline. A shorter adventure, but one for half the price. It would be the first major downloadable title on the PlayStation Network. Congratulations! You remind me of me when I was a young fighter. Only shorter and less strapping. Quest for Booty, released on August 21st of 2008, picked up just after Clank was stolen. The game dove deeper into the lore behind the space pirates. After infiltrating a pirate fleet, Ratchet found himself stuck on a planet with no means of escape. And so, the Lombax discovered the little-known pirate party foul 21-13, which states, Never interrupt a band of grogged up space pirates simply because you lost your robotic mate and seek the assistance of a dead captain. There, he learned of a device that could reveal Clank's location, the Obsidian Eye, but it was missing its power source. In the process of trying to find one, Ratchet resurrected an old pirate captain who went on a pillaging spree. I think you two could do as a good pillaging! Ratchet defeated the enemy pirates and used the Obsidian Eye to discover that Clank was being held captive by none other than Dr. Nefarious. Our hero took off into space! Little did he know, the greatest challenge he would ever face lay just ahead. <laughs> the end. Want to hear it again? I didn't want to hear it the first time, you mangy old bucket of balls. While there was some notable experiments with light versus dark gameplay, the majority of the sequel seemed like more of an epilogue to Tools of Destruction than a standalone game. There were no new weapons, but there was the Kinetic Tether Gadget, a wrench upgrade that allowed Ratchet to manipulate objects from a distance. Quest told enough of the story to align itself as the middle chapter following Tools of Destruction. It would wrap up the trilogy with a bang. Row! Row! Oh, let me guess. Row? Shut up! In 2009, Ratchet and Clank again landed at the Game Developers Conference with the announcement of a crack in time. A Design Your Own Weapon contest was held and the winner's creation, Spiral of Death, was included in the final product. The conclusion to the future trilogy launched on October 27th that year. Come on, it's time to go. In some ways, Insomniac presented Crack in Time as two games in one, but to do this, it needed to separate the titular team from most of the mission. Ratchet started on the move to find his robotic better half, hopping from planet to planet. Clank was being held prisoner on the Great Clock, 
a large timekeeping device built by the Zoni in the exact center of the universe. Give or take 50 feet. Clank made a daring escape and discovered he was born inside the Great Clock and was the next in line to maintain the powerful machine. Clank was given the Chrono Scepter and began tackling large levels on his own by recording and playing back time. Now I've got you. It can't be. Meanwhile, Ratchet met another Lombax named Azimuth, who knew his father, and the two learned much about their place in the universe. As expected, Dr. Nefarious watched Clank this entire time and waited for the robot to enter the main clock chamber. Clank was transported to a planet where he and Ratchet were finally reunited. The duo stopped the doctor and saved time itself. Looks like there's just one more thing to fix. Timekeeper restored. Separating Clank from Ratchet allowed the two to focus on their strengths. Ratchet traveled to various worlds, but their maps were much more linear. Between Planets was an overworld that allowed Ratchet to battle ships, explore moons, and do missions for various aliens. You get the Fongoids to safety. Okay, anybody need to use the bathroom? I don't want to leave the loading bay and then here one of you has to go. The platforming was more Clank's department. He could record his actions and play them back in sequence to duplicate himself throughout time, creating puzzles the series and the genre had never seen before. Space. It's huge. So huge, in fact, that if you lost your car keys in it, they would be almost impossible to find. Ratchet was given modifiable weapons for the first time in the series, like the Constructo Bomb Glove and the Constructo Shotgun, both customizable with parts that Ratchet found along the way. The devices were gone, and both Mr. Zircon and the Groovatron could now be upgraded through experience. The Rift Inducer 5000 and the Tesla Spikes topped the list of new armaments. The Omnisoaker Gadget took in certain fluids and expelled them back out, and the Hover Boots offset the loss of the platforming kick Ratchet got from Clank's thrusters. I pray the cosmos light the way towards a future you yourself design. A Crack in Time was another successful voyage for the series. It reviewed well, it sold well, and it meant that Ratchet and Clank now had two platform trilogies under their gadget belt. Some complained the various game modes hadn't evolved much in the series' history, while others felt the weapons and puzzle sequences were some of the most original on the platform. It received four nominations from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, including Outstanding Achievement in Animation. At this point, Insomniac once again chose to take the series in a new direction. Much like Deadlocked from 2005, 2011's All For One was not exactly what fans had sought to satiate their appetites for nuts and bolts. You ready, pal? Developed by Insomniac's new studio in North Carolina, All For One, as the name implied, doubled the deadlocked equation to include four players, rounded out by former foes Captain Quark and Dr. Nefarious. The game sold just under a million copies, and reviews were generally well below the expected standards set by prior games in the series. I know how you feel, kid. Perhaps nothing will keep fans sitting still until a new trilogy begins on what will likely be the PlayStation 4. That's not one of mine. Are you okay? Got knocked out there for a minute. When the galaxy is in peril, Ratchet and Clank always seem to be at the ready, and their games harken back to a time where exploration and adventure were key elements in the medium, where the journey itself was just as rewarding as accomplishing the primary goal, where a new upgrade to an existing weapon can completely turn a game on its head. That and blowing things up is always really, really fun. Not many characters introduced at the turn of the century are still on active duty. Ratchet and Clank are still in orbit because their series is rewarding to players of all types and ages. Who knows what galaxies await? And remember, the universe has a wonderful sense of humor. The trick is learning how to take a joke. <laughs>